Gary, thank you uh, for, for doing this. Uh, I know we've had some good talks in the past, and one of the things I wanted to talk about, if you don't mind, is some of the research you're doing in psychedelics, because I think that is something that uh, is not something we commonly talk about here. But if, if you could give us your background for the, for the members that aren't aware of your, your, your background stuff, just to kind of get that going, and then we can get into some different topics. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hey, everyone. I am an internal medicine doctor. I, um, I trained at Indiana University, and um, for a long time, I worked in hospitals. I was trained as a hospitalist for the most part. Um, I uh, started Evolve Healthcare about four years ago now, and that's a, my private practice in Woodland Hills. And through Sean, through uh, my buddy Brian of Food Lies, um, I kind of discovered this low carb world and eventually carnivore. And it's become a huge part of my practice. I have tons of carnivores. I have tons of um, low carb folks in my practice. Um, it's really, you know, uh, we have another company called Sapien and Sapien is sort of our concept of ancestral eating and um, kind of through those platforms, I'm trying to promote healthy lifestyle. And I got connected with Sean um, through Brian a long time ago, or I guess now it's been a year or so. And I'm a huge supporter of the carnivore movement. Um, yeah, it's great. And I'm happy to be here and share um, oh, yeah. And so then I should mention the psychedelic stuff, where, what Sean has me on here for. So I believe strongly, you know, you know, nutrition is the cornerstone of good health. Um, but really, we need to focus on mental health in this country. It's, it's a huge problem. And obviously, with COVID, it's, uh, and we can talk about it, it's absolutely un unbelievable what I'm seeing in my clinic. Um, and I believe, you know, using daily suppressive sedating drugs, drugs that numb you, things like antidepressants, like SSRIs, benzos, opiates, I don't think that's the solution. And um, as part of my practice, I have a ketamine therapy clinic, and we use ketamine um, as, as a modality to help people heal their mental illnesses. And, you know, I'm a supporter of uh, psilocybin, MDMA, which are both kind of coming down the pipeline as options for folks. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's kind of the, the overview. Um, so let me, you know, it's kind of interesting because, you know, obviously everyone here or the majority of the folks here that are listening have certainly bought into the uh, animal based nutrition as being superior and helpful. And a lot of people have solved a lot of health problems by eliminating not only just refined processed food, which is, I think everybody would be better to, to eliminate, but some of us have found by actually pulling out the spinaches and the broccoli actually yeah. made them healthier for whatever crazy reason that just seems to be the situation um but then there is you know certainly i'd say reasonable evidence that plants can have a medicinal role and many people still find that even within this community certainly within other communities some of it is uh, context dependent you know some of the some of the you know some of the plants that have reportedly anti-inflammatory effects uh, that may be the case if you're on an inflammatory diet in this first place. And so sometimes it's kind of like, you know, putting a, a Band-Aid on, on something, which maybe if you didn't have the, the injury in the first place, you wouldn't need the Band-Aid. So talk to me about, so ketamine, I'm not sure if that's a plant-based derived thing. I mean, it was I, originally derived. It's a plant-based alkaloid, but it's def definitely a synthetic drug. But it was discovered in the 1950s when they were sort of uh, looking at different plant substances. And um, yeah, it's not necessarily considered a plant medicine, but it's in the world of plant medicine. I think uh, the way I kind of present it is, you know, rather than this daily drug, it's the idea that you can use a plant medicine, you can have an experience, a transcendental experience, if you will. And, and it, it changes your mind. It changes how the biochemistry in your brain works. And, and the experience itself has a therapeutic nature to it. Um, I, you know, coming from the ancestral mentality, um, you know, you know animal-based diet, it, for me, it is derived from the idea that, that that's how we evolved. We evolved eating animals. We evolved using animal nutrition to develop our brains. Um, and similarly, you know, uh, societies have been using these kind of rites of passage, ritualistic kind of experiences using psychedelic drugs um, as a way to, to grow and, and to expand their, their mind and, and their perspective on the world. 
And, you know, everything from, you know, ayahuasca to ibogaine have been used by, you know, ancient societies to, to heal their, their people. And it's something that I think in America we did. We did it a long time ago, 100 years ago. We used to do things like this. And, and sort of with the, with the growth of Western medicine, we suppressed that. That didn't make anyone money. And we moved towards this, you know, daily suppressive drug model. Um, and it parallels what we're doing with metabolic health. You know, take a statin, take a beta blocker. Don't, don't change your life. Don't do something profound. And so I, I see a big parallel between, you know, psychedelic medicine and uh, paired with psychotherapy and sort of what you're doing with MeetRx and teaching people how to eat again, you know? Yeah, and that's the point I want to, I guess, just get out of the way. I think that, you know, from a mental health standpoint, and you point out rightfully so that we do have a huge mental health problem in this country and, 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 and quite honestly, most countries at this point. Um, we've seen a tremendous rise in the incidence of pretty much every mental health disorder that you can talk about over the last, you know, a couple generations. I think diet certainly has a role in that. I think you'd be silly not to believe that at this point. Um, Absolutely. I, I think, you know, when we start talking about ketamine therapy or ibogaine, ibogaine or you know, psilocybin or any of those things, do you predicate that that those things are going to be more effective in somebody that's already eating an appropriate diet. And then you have somebody that, you know, maybe they've cleaned up their diet. They got rid of the garbage. They got, you know, a nutrient appropriate diet for their, for their mental health or brain health. Then you add those things on uh, because, you know, what I would say is, you know, when you talk about these rites of passages in these, you know, primitive populations, indigenous tribes, they aren't e they are not eating a junk food diet to start with and so so do you think that i mean do you think this is an add-on or can be can i take someone on the standard american diet run them through some ketamine therapy and expect to have a good result or does that or or, do, or should we expect to see the see the diet play a role as well yeah i hear you um i think that a you know real human health is not one drug it's not one modality it's not even just one diet everyone is is different and you have to take a a multi-faceted approach i think if someone is really struggling with mental health issues and again it depends on the mental health issue and we can talk about the difference between anxiety and depression versus something like ptsd which is a different process in a lot of ways um i think that you can still help people with ketamine that are on a standard american diet but I, you know, my approach, at least in my clinic, is to present a whole lifestyle, a, you know, nutrition plan, a movement plan, a stress management plan, a sun exposure plan, like all of these things have to come together. Um, so, so can someone on a standard American diet benefit from, um, you know, a ketamine experience or an ayahuasca experience or eventually a psilocybin experience? Um, yeah, I think there's a benefit, but, you know, you call it like an add-on. I think it's individual. For some people, they they have great mental health. They have issues with food. They find a carnivore approach, and it's what they need. And it, and it's sort of the the key that unlocks their puzzle. But for a lot of people, that they're carrying a lot of baggage with them. Um, you know, pe people have very very complicated mental health situations. So I think that. By offering something other than just suppressive sedating drugs, but something that can really transcend and transform someone in addition to nutrition, in addition to exercise. I think that's where we're really going to see, you know, a change in people's, you know, long-term outcomes. Um, you know, for me, the connection is if, if we can get people to open their mind to the idea that our nutrition recommendations are bunk, complete bunk, and that, you know, a lot of Key, key concepts in nutrition that are extremely healing, like eating meat, like fasting, uh, like avoiding certain plants that could be toxic, right? Um, if you could open their mind that those things that were taught to them are wrong and there's a better way to do it, then you can also teach them that, you know, the way we've been taught to use drugs is wrong. Like the, the idea that you have to take a drug every day, the idea that you have to add on this therapy and now you're stuck to it. As opposed to, you know, my, I have a lot of patients that have come into the ketamine program. They go through a six treatment protocol, which takes uh, anywhere from six to 12 weeks. And that's it. They don't need more ketamine. 
they, they've, they've accomplished their goal. And some of those folks will come back and have, uh, you know, another experience or do another set of sessions. And sometimes it's to address a different part of their mental health, if that makes sense. So I think that it's, it's a whole different paradigm in thinking about how we treat mental health when you bring psychedelics and psychotherapy into the mix. Gary, let me ask you, what, um, how do you determine what patient gets what? I mean, how do you know you're going to, you're going to do ketamine versus, you know, psilocybin versus MDMA or, or whatever modality yeah. you decide, decide to use? How do you, how do you know going in what people are going to be responsive to? So first of all, I wish I could offer multiple modalities right now. Ketamine is the only thing I can legally offer. Um, ketamine has always been available to folks and ketamine clinics have been, um, open around the country for the last 50 or 60 years. Um, they've waned in popularity, you know, depending on how powerful the drug war influence was. And, and more recently, it's become more popular. When we talk about these other drugs, um, I'm talking more about those are coming down the pipeline. Psilocybin and MDMA are currently being research, uh, studied. We're in phase three clinical trials with MDMA. Um, psilocybin's, I think phase two, I think they started some phase three trials. And a lot of those are driven by the VA administration because we have so many vets suffering. Um, so I personally don't yet get to tell people ketamine or psilocybin or MDMA, um, ayahuasca and ibogaine aren't in, in the medical world yet. Um, I talk about it more generally because people pursue some of this stuff outside of, you know, my office. And, and so it, it's part of the conversation, but like medically speaking, um, right now I'm only offering ketamine. Um, in a dream world, in the future, when these things become available, it, it depends on the pa patient. So something we do in our clinic that sh everyone should understand is um, before anyone gets a chance to do ketamine or, or have an experience like that, uh, they meet with Dr. Kalstein, who's uh, my therapist, and she's a naturopathic physician, and we work together as a team. Uh, and they meet with me, and we have a screening uh, we have a whole screening process. If they're on a certain drugs that can, can cause side effects, we, you know, that's not offered to them. If we don't think that their particular mental disorder, for example, schizophrenia, uh, paranoid issues, don't really go well with ketamine. So we, we'll just, we won't offer it to them. Um, so, so there's definitely you know, contraindications to the treatment. Um, most of our patients are uh, three, three kinds of patients. We have Real, real depression, refractory depression, people who have failed multiple drugs. We also have folks that refuse to do something like an antidepressant, like an SSRI, because they know the negative side effects and they don't want to be on something every day. Um, anxiety responds pretty well. Um, and, and that tends to, to use a little bit of a lower dose of ketamine with a lot more therapy uh, and, and our therapy modalities uh, vary, and we can talk about that. And then addiction. Um, ketamine is very, very powerful, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it's a great tool to break addiction cycles, addiction processes in the brain. So we've had some real success with alcohol and a couple of patients with uh, opiate issues. Um, so to answer your question, Sean, right now, I can offer ketamine. Some people that come to us are good candidates. Some people aren't. Um, and... Our goal, our dream, uh, as MDMA and psilocybin become available, uh, that we can start tailoring the treatment a little bit to the patient. Um, you know, when it comes to PTSD, MDMA is a very powerful tool because of the way it changes your brain and the way you can reassociate memories with, with positive emotions instead of negative emotions. So I hope one day to be able to offer that sort of option. Someone comes to me, they're dealing with depression, anxiety, but we get to the root of it and it's really a PTSD process and that would be a great patient for MDMA whereas someone who's really dealing with refractory depression and and that's the root of it then ketamine uh, is something that I would offer them but for sure it has to be an individualized approach every single person is different uh, comorbidities matter people with blood pressure issues for example it's a little more risky with ketamine um, so so it's an evolving field the you know, and, and my goal is to kind of be on the front lines and help people develop it. There's a great organization for those of you who are interested called MAPS. Um, uh, and, and they're working with the VA uh, to really drive the MDMA research. Uh, the ketamine research has been done. There's more research being done, but that drug 
is is legal and we can use it already. Whereas MDMA and psilocybin are are still considered class one drugs, so we haven't um, we haven't been able to use them in you know in my clinic yet. But soon, I think a few years. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, it does, Gary. Do you see any uh, uh, role? I mean, because this is this is being widely used, and it's been I guess even a little ahead of these things for medical medical cannabis. CBD, you know, those types of things. Is that something you use part of your practice? Who, which people are those benefit? We have some people within this community that utilize that in conjunction with the carnivore diet and it's helped with things like depression. Um, do, is that absolutely. part of your practice? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny. I, uh, you know, we start talking about psychedelic drugs and cannabis doesn't even come to mind, but it's definitely considered, you know, it's in that world. Uh, I'm in Los Angeles. Uh, marijuana is everywhere. Uh, you know, developing a medical practice around, you know, med- marijuana recommendations is not something that would make sense for me. Um, but I do a ton of marijuana recommendations. It's sort of become part, it's not even part of the, you know, the mental health practice. It's part of my primary care practice. I can't tell you how many patients I've gotten off of benzodiazepines and opiates using marijuana. Um, for me, it's, it's literally just part of my primary care recommendations. If it's a patient that's open-minded to it, if it's a patient that's wanting to get off of some of these addictive substances, then I make recommendations. Um, we've got a ton of clubs nearby, and I'm partnered with uh, one of the clubs uh, down the street for me. Um, they're really focused on CBD products, wellness. Uh, they have like a biohacking facility in there. They do you know uh, UV light therapy, cold immersion therapy. So we're really like-minded. And um, I'll send folks there and they have, and, and, and basically I'll, I'll give them recommendations. I'll say, hey, this kind of strain would work well for you or go talk to the bud tender about, um, you know, what's the best CBD option or, you know, CBD THC tincture, you know, with a four to one ratio or five to one ratio. I'll give them kind of guidance and then I'll send them over there and they'll kind of fine tune the prescription, if you will. Um, but it's, it's funny. It, because it's 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 legal here and it's so ubiquitous it's not really medical anymore you know what i'm saying like it's become more like i just give them a recommendation hey you should take some magnesium you should take some of this and you should take a cbd product it's part of my supplement regimen in a way um and, and i think that's probably regional i think it's because it's just so commonplace here i mean there's literally 10 clubs within a one mile radius of my office so it's you know, it's different than the psychedelic stuff, but um, I have seen that folks can use marijuana to come off of much more uh, sort of addictive and negative substances. And, and I do think that taking benzos and opiates every day is, is really bad for your, your body as opposed to marijuana, which I think can be consumed in a much healthier way. So a couple of questions from the chat. One was, you know, do you see a role for people with eating disorders? Do, do these, met, do these uh, compounds have a role in that? And the second question is, you know, many people that present with depression, uh, other mental health orders, you know, may have an underlying maybe sleep disorder, maybe sleep apnea, something like that. Do you, do you have to address those things first before you start putting different drugs in the system? Yeah. So that's part of our initiation, initial kind of consultation. We, um, I do the medical assessment. And if I'm worried that someone is suffering from terrible sleep apnea, they're morbidly obese, and they're not really a great candidate to start on a psychedelic experience. And instead, we need to focus on nutrition and lifestyle changes first, then that's what I recommend. Um, and and there have been a few folks that have done a six month program with me and then initiated their psychedelic experience. Um, as far as the psychedelic part goes, we go through a step of, of intention setting. So there has to be a goal to your experience. Uh, and so, you know, depending on what the patient is coming in for, sometimes there is a role for, hey, I have an eating disorder, or, or hey, I have these other medical issues, but I need to get past the mental block. This, is, this one issue is really bothering me. And so we can work on that issue and then dive into the lifestyle modifications. So it can go both ways as far as that goes. When it comes to eating disorder, um, I actually haven't had any folks use that, uh, use uh, ketamine for an eating disorder. Um, you know, s- some, of, some of my patients, it, it's, it's really a food addiction, right? Um, I think everyone's different. And, and one of the things that ketamine is able to do um, is, is, 
induce some neuroplasticity in the brain. And the idea and how the kind of the mechanistic idea by, by how it would work with, um, with addiction, whether that's food addiction or, or, or uh, what I have experienced with is drug addiction is, is it helps. So your brain creates a groove. You get used to going through the same mental process. That's a, that's in, in your brain, it's a mental process, but on, in reality, it's neurons firing in a similar pattern over and over and over again. And that sort of, you can imagine it kind of burns in a groove and, and your brain just goes to those grooves all the time. And by inducing neuroplasticity on a biochemical level, um, we're, you know, presumably it helps you change your mind. It helps you break out of those grooves and create new grooves and create new patterns of thinking. So, so that coupled with an experience that's psychedelic, an experience that's sort of out of body, it is a disassociative drug. So it separates your sort of mental space from the physical body. And that can be jarring, but it can also be very therapeutic to be able to step away from yourself and look at yourself and say, wow, I don't need to feel this way. I don't need to behave in these actions. I, I can pull myself out of it. Sometimes just that experience, even in one session, you can see the light go off in someone's head. And, oh my gosh, I don't need to be this way. I can change myself. So there's, those are two kind of mechanisms by which ketamine can really help with addiction processes. Could it help someone with food addiction? I haven't done it in my clinic yet. I really take a lifestyle coaching approach to food issues for the most part. Um, but I think I'd be open to it if, given the right patient. How predictable, uh, how predictable are the effects? Uh, what are the side effects? What are the, what are the, who are the people specifically you say no to? And what percentage of your practice is dedicated to this versus more traditional medicine at this point? So, um, so I'm partnered with Dr. Kalstein uh, on the mental health, especially the ketamine program. I would say that's probably 20% of our practice now. It was growing rapidly and then COVID hit and COVID has really slowed us down. We didn't feel comfortable. So one of the things is that this isn't something that you give someone a drug, they go home, hey, feel better, see you later. It's a very involved experience. The patient comes into the office, uh, we supervise them, we have a heart monitor on them. Um, and, and Dr. Kalstein engages in therapy, psychotherapy. It could sometimes be sound therapy. Uh, sometimes they just sit in silence and, and have a moment. It, it's, it's variable, but it's very hands-on and involved. So COVID really doesn't let us do that, at least right now. So right now it's probably 10% of my practice, but it's, it's something that we know folks need and we're going to grow it. Um, so that's where we stand with that. It, it was going to be bigger. It will come back. Um, that being said, as far as side effects, people that are generally metabolically unwell, um, you know, we don't, we don't have a ton of super sick patients getting ketamine. And I'm, frankly, I wouldn't recommend doing a psychedelic drug um, unless if you're really unhealthy. So it's mostly, uh, it's mostly people, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. We've had a couple of folks and folks in their 70s. Um, if you're older, it's more dangerous. Um, it can really spike your blood pressure. It can make you anxious. You have to be mentally prepared for it. So, um, you know, if you have uncontrolled hypertension, it's a no-no. If you have kidney failure, if you have heart failure and you're in active sort of management, we won't do the treatment. Um, so it's, so, so you can't really be that unhealthy, at least in our clinic, that's not something we do. Um, that being said, I've had a number of people that were obese with high blood pressure. We got, well, I mentioned the one, one patient specifically, they lost weight, got the blood pressure under control, went through a ketamine experience, and it was really powerful. So um, we, the, the big side effects would be, would be uh, elevations in blood pressure, um, nausea and vomiting. Uh, that's more of an acute effect, and we mitigate that with medication if we need to. Um, that's really it. And, and as far as the predictable, the predictability of its effects, I can for sure predict that you're going to have a disassociative experience. How you respond to that experience, I cannot predict. That's why we're there the whole time. And, and it's, a, it's very much a psychotherapy, uh, physician-patient experience. And um, for the most part, people gain a lot of wisdom, self you know, they understand themselves better. Um, 
there's some people that get scared and it's alarming and, and they stop. And, and one of the things we do to kind of mitigate that is we start very, very low doses and we, we go up and up and up depending on the patient's response. Most ketamine pro programs that you look uh, at the country, they do it as an intravenous infusion and they do pretty high doses. Um, the reason being is that ketamine is really in medicine used as an anesthesia drug. Uh, they use really high doses. They put people out. They could then you know, do surgery. It doesn't cause respiratory depression, um, which is a real nasty side effect of opiates and benzos. Um, and it's not, addict, it's not habit forming, really not in the way benzos and, and opiates are on a physiological level. So it's a great anesthesia drug. Most providers that are delivering it for mental health are, uh, are pain doctors, anesthesiologists that are used to these high doses. One of the things that me and Dr. Galstein are very passionate about is that it's not about knocking someone out. It's about putting them into this kind of psychedelic state where they're there, um, but they're also disconnected. And, and you leveraging that experience to really make some breakthroughs. So we do it as an intramuscular injection, usually in the shoulder. We start with low doses, especially on the first time to, to kind of initiate a per person, especially if they're drug naive. You know, some folks have tried psychedelic drugs in their pr private life, and they're much more open and able to tolerate a higher dose. So again, we tailor it to the individual. But um, uh, most, most of the experiences we've had is on the second or third time is where a patient will get to that dose where they really have a profound sort of, you know, you can call it spiritual experience. And, um, and, and, here, and, it's, and it's not even just the experience. This is another point I want to make. So we set an intention at the beginning of our, uh, of our therapy, right? And we, we curate the set and the setting. We make sure that the person is comfortable. We have a beautiful room. We, we control the sound. It smells nice. All of those things matter. You have to feel comfortable. And then most importantly is the integration session afterwards. For some people, that's in separate office visit. For others, it happens as they're coming off of the medication. But, but talking about and processing what it means, what, what their experience actually means and how they can take that and, and change their lives with it. And I think that, that that really differentiates us from a lot of other clinics because um, the integration part is where the healing happens. The experience itself is either scary or fun or a mix of both, depending on who you are, but it's the integration of, of what, you know, what those experiences mean to you and how you can take them to the rest of your life. Um, and so, so if anyone at listening is ever interested in this, uh, that's the thing you have to focus on is taking this experience and, and helping it change you. And, and that's the goal. It's, it's to change your behaviors, right? similarly to, you know, the nutrition recommendations, it's to change your behaviors so that you can really change your body and change your mind. And it's the same thing. Instead of suppressing your behaviors, sedating your brain, it's about opening it up and, and letting you see that, if you will. Yeah, my, my experience with ketamine as a physician, you know, I used to use it just yeah. like you said in the role of uh, an anesthetic when we used to change, uh, when I was working at the pediatric burn hospital, you know, we would change kids' bandages and we, you know, they would, they would push, uh, push a uh, ketamine infusion. The kids' eyes would roll back in their heads, you know, we'd watch until they'd go out, then we'd be able to change their bandage. And then the other time would be in the emergency room when I was, you know, putting someone's shoulder back in place or, you know, whatever, elbow back in place when they dislocated or setting a fracture. Uh, so it did, you know, the, I guess the big advantage was the lack of respiratory depression, which you rightly point out that the, uh, a lot of the other drugs do have. Um, Sean, did you also notice that a lot of folks actually had a pleasant experience and when they came out, they were not so sad? Um, you know, That's something I, you observed? I mean, I can't really, you know, with the pediatric burn patients, it was hard to really assess yeah. that because they're in a pretty bad place generally. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, like I said, in the ER, uh, you know, I, I don't, I can't really remember. I, I paid much attention to it. I was just well, you kind of did your thing and you got out of yeah, there, right? I was, I was usually up there writing up the writing up and doing the paperwork. And exactly. And they were, where they were coming out of it and stuff like that. But, uh, um, well, what, one point I want to make before the question, though, and it just speaks to what you said, is think about how safe this drug is. 
you're in a pedi- you're using it in a pediatric population. You're using it in the emergency room when you're trying to break people's bones back in place or relocate bones. And we don't worry so much about it because we know how safe it is. And I think that that's something that people need to realize is that it has a great side effect profile. It's, it's very, very, it's just a safe drug to use. And I think that uh, it's been vilified, you know, the K hole, uh, you know, at least from the nineties, we heard a lot about that. And, and I just think that that's a lot of, you know, negative publicity that, you know, it's not true about this drug. Yeah, I'm not sure what, what the what the vilification is, but I do see, I mean, when we hear about some of these, you know, unregulated medicines like ayahuasca and stuff like that, where people talk them there, they're, they're, they go to, they go down to Mexico or South America or wherever, and they have, you know, and they, they end up vomiting half the time. And I mean, it just yeah. seems like that has a long way to go before that would reach any sort of acceptance, uh, at least here. Do you, what, what, so ketamine obviously has been, been on the formulary forever. I mean, this is not a new drug. Some of these other, like like you said, some of these other psychedelics, which have not been used medicinally, at least in a controlled fashion, where do you think the next one is going to be? What's the next one that's going to be approved for wide, wide use? MDMA. MDMA is uh, overwhelmingly, uh, overwhelmingly beneficial for folks with PTSD. It's in phase three clinical trials, which means that they've already pro- proved its efficacy. They've already proved its safety profile. And now they're tweaking the dose and the protocol. And, and they're, they're using it on our vets. Uh, PTSD is, is a scary, scary process. And uh, why MDMA is so powerful to heal it. And if you guys look up the MAPS organization, they have a ton of content on it because, and they'll do a better job than I will. But just to kind of, as an overview, MDMA induces a sense of love and euphoria. Um, it, really, it really helps people connect with their emotions um, with, in a positive way, like a, a sense of love. That's really what's described by folks that are taking that medicine. And so uh, with PTSD, what happens is you, you, you have a memory of an experience and it's, it's married to an emotional state that's fight or flight. It's horror. It's, it's, it's panic. And, and people go through this memory and experience over and over again. And every time it's triggering this fight or flight horror experience. And so uh, the idea with MDMA therapy for PTSD is you, you, you take, the, take the medicine, it induces this sense of love and acceptance. And then using a th- therapist at your bedside, you, you re-explore those memories. And, and over time, you're trying to marry those memories to a sense of acceptance and love and you're trying to extinguish that flight or flight relationship with the with the memory and and the evidence is overwhelming um that it's effective and and it's in a similar fashion it's these treatment sessions i I think their protocol is two times a week uh for three to four weeks don't quote me on that. Um, there, there's, they're working on it. So that, that, that was the last thing I, I kind of read about. But that sort of idea that you go through a few weeks of treatment, maybe a few months of one or two treatments a week, and you reprogram your brain to change your relationship with these memories. What and is so the- MDMA is not far. Um, go ahead. You no, know, I was going to ask what the... Uh- you know, I guess the length of tra- treatment and then the duration of efficacy. I mean, you, you know, you do, you do a month or whatever, and then how long does it, do you have to repeat? This I, I don't have that information. Yeah. It, it, for sure. It's going to be variable. If it's anything like ketamine, it, it really is variable. Some people fa- find that, you know, they, okay. We had this one gentleman who was, you know, he was really struggling with alcohol. Nothing had worked. He'd been addicted for 30 years. He could never spend more than two weeks away from alcohol. We went through a series of six treatments and, for six months, he did not have a craving. He did not think about it. It was just not there. Um, and then he started thinking about it. He came back to us and we did a few more sessions. Um, I, I don't know about the MDMA. That, that's not something I actually do practice in, but, but they're all going to be similar. And I think everyone's going to be different. I think for some folks, if they're able to really change their life, adopt a healthy diet, adopt a healthy exercise habits, you know, um, then they may not ever need to go back to the medicine. Um, but for others, life is more difficult. 
and, and going back and using it, I think going back and doing a few treatments intermittently of every few months even is a much better approach to mental health than, than sedating yourself every day. Um, is there any evidence or in your experience, do you seek any kind of like a tolerance to this where someone, you know, you know, it's less effective the second time and they need a higher and higher dosage. Do you see that occur to some degree? With ketamine, for sure, you get used to the experience. Um, you don't, um, so, no, so no, that you don't, you don't stop having the disassociative experience. It, it's really weight-based with ketamine. With MDMA, um, with MDMA, I'm not 100% sure. Um, and with psilocybin, it's definitely a weight-based, uh, a weight-based experience. And, and it doesn't, as far as the research I've looked at, it doesn't sort of fade away. But again, when, when you think about, you know, getting used to it and, and developing a tolerance, that, that's it's usually in the setting of taking something every day, right? And because we're not doing that with these drugs, you, you don't tend to build a tolerance. If anything, you just kind of get used to this, the mental experience and are able to tolerate more, more of that so we can kind of crank up the dose if that's something beneficial. But again, like with ketamine, a lot of the benefits happen with a very low dose. And, and it's something that I really talk about a lot because so many clinics, it's like more is better. But the problem is, is if you get a lot of drug, you're, you're out, you're asleep. That's not the goal. So, um, you know, I think there's definitely like a sweet spot for each person. And uh, for some drugs like ketamine, it's weight-based. Um, and as far as addictive potential, all of these drugs that affect your brain this dramatically have an addictive potential. I do not recommend doing them at home on your own without supervision or at a party, God forbid, where you can have a bad trip. Bad trips are a failure of set and setting. It's not an inherent problem with a drug. But if you're not thoughtful, if you're taking these substances in like a dangerous environment or around people that are negative and not supportive of you or in some environment where you don't have control, where you can't go pee if you have to pee or lay down if you need to lay down, then yeah, you could really get in a bad place with all of the drugs we're talking about. So I think it, that that's really important to remember that unlike some of the other drugs that we use in Western medicine that have, you know, you take it, this is the effect. It doesn't matter. This is what you get there's a lot of variability depending on the environment, the people around you, what your mental state is going in. So sending the correct intention and, and, and then the outcomes are a lot very much driven by how you integrate those experiences. So it's a much more dynamic process than like, here's an antidepressant. You're now numb. You're not crying as much. You're not feeling anything as much, but Hey, that's okay. Keep on going about your business. That's our approach, as it, you know, in Western medicine. And this approach is much more dynamic. Um, there's more variables, and it's obviously going to take a lot more research. But it it it's anchored in our ancestry. It's anchored in how our brains, I think, want to operate, uh, as opposed to what we do in Western medicine, which is shut down the brain. Can you comment, I don't know if you have any experience, you probably don't have any direct experience to this, but you might have some, uh, you know, some, some knowledge on this. There's a drug out there called Ibogaine, which I think Chris Bell has been a proponent of. I mean, my understanding is it's been used traditionally to sort of detox people off heroin. Uh, it does have some cardiovascular, I think, negative potential potentials. Can you, is that something you have any knowledge on that you can comment on? Of all these drugs, it's probably the one I have least experience with, if I'm gonna be honest with you. So yeah, I, I don't, I can't really comment on it. I think though, to speak more generally, all drugs have effects and side effects. Some are desired and some are not. And I think you have to weigh the risks and benefits. And for the most part, all of these are gonna tax your cardiovascular system. So if you have poorly controlled diabetes, poorly controlled blood pressure, or heart issues, it probably none of them are a good idea for you. Um, and the idea is to get these things under control and then use these medicines strategically to heal. And again, that that's the other thing. The goal here is to heal. It's not to become dependent on those experiences. It's to change. So you don't need them in the future. I mean, I, you mentioned you do an intramuscular route. Does that 
I mean, it seems like that would make the, the onset of action a little less predictable. Is that, is that, I mean, is it just for ease of administration or what's the, what's the rationale behind that? Yeah, so there's been some great research in the uh, emergency medicine world uh, showing that IV and intramuscular are pretty comparable. Um, nowadays, intranasal insufflation has become really popular. So something we didn't mention yet is ketamine has recently been approved by the FDA as a, as a treatment for refractory depression. Um, but remember, ketamine is a generic drug uh, that no one can own. So Johnson & Johnson uh, created, t- took the S enantiomer, so there's a two enantiomers, so the sort of mirror images of each other. They took the an S enantiomer and they, um, they patented it very clever. And they didn't have to do a lot of research because there's so much research already. They did two small studies to show that basically it works very similar to regular ketamine, which is a a mix of the two enantiomers. And they called it Spravato. And they packaged it in an intranasal spray. And uh, the protocol is very similar to what I described with my ketamine program. You come into the office, you take a nasal spray, uh, you sit there for about an hour or two being supervised to make sure the heart and and the blood pressure are stable and, and you get out of there. And, and that is now FDA approved. Um, so uh, intranasal insufflation is very effective and a fast way to get it in there. Uh, intramuscular works. The difference with IV and IM is that as you're dripping the drug IV, you can titrate the dose in real time, right? So if it's really low dose and you're sort of, oh, it's okay, I, I got it. Okay, well, we could turn it up, right? So for people that are targeting a higher doses of ketamine, IV administration makes a lot of sense because you can con- watch it and control it and really tweak it. Our approach is, is not to have such high doses. So um, when you do an intramuscular shot, you sort of put in the dose and you see what happens. It takes about five minutes to really start kicking in. And within 20 or 30 minutes, you're, you're deep in the experience. Um, most sessions, will a patient will have a one shot and then maybe one or two follow-up shots depending on their response. Um, and then we'll, we'll often give uh, an antiemetic like Zofran, something to help control nausea. Um, so, so they work very similarly, um, but they're, they're used differently. So for us, because we're not going for high doses and we're really going for an, uh, you know, sort of a psychotherapy experience with, with this ketamine enhancing it, the intramuscular works well for us because we're not trying to go so high. Um, but, but they both, they both do the job. They're both very effective. Uh, they're not metabolized differently when you do intramuscular or IV or intranasal. Um, and I should also mention there are sublingual lozenges available. It's like a little, little piece of wax and you put it under your tongue and it melts sort of over the 10, 15 minutes and, and it gets absorbed under under the veins and under your tongue. So they all work. Um, and, and it just depends on the protocol and what your goals are. Uh, we like I am because it emphasizes that we're not trying to do a high dose, but also it's without, um, you know, when you're doing an IV, you have an IV in your arm, you have tape, you're, you're sort of strapped in. And, and our goal is to really unencumber the patient and let them feel comfortable. They can lay down, they can do some stretches. Um, you know, it, it's more free. And again, because we're so focused on the set and setting and we think it's such a powerful part of this whole puzzle, um, that's why we chose that. And, and we are talking about bringing in insufflation. The problem with insufflation, which is the spread, you have to get the drug compounded and, and, and you can have some variability in dosing. So we haven't felt really comfortable getting something that's consistent. Spravato, which is the Johnson & Johnson one, is great, by the way, but it's very, very hard to get it approved by insurances at this time. I'm, I'm working on it and it's, it's a huge challenge and they haven't made it easy. And, and interestingly, and, and I think this is pretty sad, um, they pay for, when you do get it approved, they'll pay for the administration of the drug, they'll pay for the drug. They do not require, nor will they pay for psychotherapy. And that is a shame because the whole point is to do some kind of therapy. The whole point is to work with a specialist really unpack what you're trying to accomplish. And so that's actually held me back from working with Spravato um, just because I, I want to I offer psychotherapy. And most patients that are pursuing Spravato don't want to pay out of pocket. So when I say, hey, yeah, we can offer Spravato, but 
you know, you got to pay, we, we, we do therapy, you got to pay for the therapist. They're like, no. And I don't really want to support that because I don't want to support just doing drugs. We're, we're healing. And, and I think that, like I said, it's this it's multi, it's, it's this, all these components have to come together to heal. Can you just walk us through, like, say a patient comes in, he's going to do a ketamine therapy. What can you walk us through from the beginning to end what, what they're going to experience? Yeah. So first of all, someone reaches it out and they're interested in it. And the first thing that they do is set up a discovery call with me or Dr. Calstein. And we talk about what their goals are. We even see if they're a good candidate. They fill out a questionnaire with their health issues, what medications they're on, all of that. Once we sort of decide, yeah, this is someone that could, that could benefit from this. Uh, they come in for this initiation evaluation and that's visiting with me. I review the medical history. I do, you know, like a medical preoperative assessment, if you will. Right. Um, and then, and then with Dr. Kalstein, it's, it's a discussion about what are your goals? What have you tried? What are you worried about? Um, you know, answering all the questions, getting all the emotions on the table so that we know what we're dealing with. Um, that is its own visit in the office. Um, we've done a few now on, on telemedicine, but we really want to be in person. So that's its own visit. They come, then we set up the, the treatment. Okay. We're going to do, you know, six sessions. We're going to do them weekly in your case, or we're going to do them twice a week in your case. And we, we, we outline the protocol and we set, what is our goal? We want to, we want to deal with this trauma from childhood. We want to deal with this anxiety I have about leaving the house. We set that intention and they go home with that and they think about it and they process it. Then they come back um, for their treatment day and, and we tend to do it in the early afternoons in my clinic. Um, and we have a beautiful private room. Like I said, it's real kind of nice. And, and I think that's important. It's re really, you know, really curated experience. You go in and you spend about 20 minutes talking to Dr. Kalstein about what is the goal for that specific session. So you have your lot more broad intention and then you have what is going to what are we accomplishing today and and that is a private experience with dr Kalstein. i'm not part of it actually and that's intentional because i there's there's so much in that relationship she builds and and they kind of decide what what is that therapy going to look like are we going to talk about stuff today are we going to be quiet today and and so that takes 20 to 30 minutes then we um, get us, you know, vitals. We get, um, sometimes I'll get an EKG if I feel it's necessary. We can do that all in the office. And then they get their shot. They lay down um, and the effects take hold within five to 10, 15 minutes, something like that. And they're under for about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, they go through their therapy, whatever that is that day with Dr. Kalstein. And, uh, and then usually folks will then get a ride home. Uh, after they sort of feel better and and oftentimes the integration will have they'll do it over a skype call or when they come back for their next session later that week or the following week that first half hour 40 minutes is spent integrating the last experience and re-establishing our new intention for that for that visit and it keeps going like that until we get through our sessions and then at the very tail end of all the treatment experiences they come back for another session with dr Kalstein to discuss where we're going to go from there. And I, and again, sometimes those are very fun conversations because they've had such a positive experience. And sometimes it's heavy because they're, they're really struggling with, with all the emotions that those experiences brought up. And, and there's a lot to unpack there. Um, but it's very involved. It's very hands-on. You know, a lot of people have gawked at the price. Um, it's not cheap. And that's because it's very involved. Dr. Kalstein has extensive amount of experience doing this therapy uh, for the last decade. And she invests herself fully into each patient. And frankly, I think for, for this kind of therapy to grow, we need to have providers that are that invested in their patients. And, and it's really something missing from healthcare as a whole is the doctor patient relationship or the therapist patient relationship. And I think this is the sort of thing that really emphasizes that. So, so by the end of this month or two month experience, you really get to know us. It's very involved. You really get to know the clinic. And, and I think on some level, it also creates like a home or like a place where they know they feel comfortable. And that has a therapeutic component in and of itself because so many people don't have a doctor or a place that they can really look to for their health. That's why Sean has this great community of people so that we can all lean on each other. And, 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 you know, 
I ranted. The, that, that's, that's the experience. That's what it looks like. It's different for everyone. And we really try to, we really try to bring them into our world to, so that they feel at home. Let me just ask one other question because uh, we're running out of time here, but um, there's been some commentary about sort of psychedelic mushrooms and I know there's mm -hmm. different types and what's, what's the active ingredient or does it vary by the mushroom and how safe are they and how can you regulate that? And what is it, what is a, you know, what can they be used for? So on a personal level, I think mushrooms have the most therapeutic potential. I think that, um, uh, so psilocybin is the active ingredient. Uh, my understanding is there's about four or six strains of mushrooms that have psilocybin in them, um, known as magic mushrooms. Right now, those are being tested. I think they're in phase two trials. And, and what they do is they powder the mushrooms and they, and they present them as little capsules. Um, the, I think, so one of the, something I'm very passionate about, and I don't talk about it so much because, you know, I do have a medical practice and we're really treating disease, but I think there's a lot to be said about the betterment of the well man. Uh, my, Michael Pollan coined that term in his book, how to change your mind. And, and if anyone's really interested in learning more about all of these drugs, how to change your mind is a great place to start. He did a great job interviewing leaders in the, in the psychedelic fields um, and, and describes all of this stuff. But um, the betterment of the well man is this idea that, look, we all have mental challenges. We all want to elevate ourselves. We all want to understand ourselves more. And, and taking psychedelics uh, outside of the medical community, uh, people, a lot of people, it's not just for fun. I'm going to party, but it's I want to grow. I want to learn. I want to see that there's other levels of life. There's, you know, you know, I could... You know, there's the joke, I'm going to talk to the tree. You can really connect with, 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 with nature using something like psilocybin. So, um, you know, it's extremely safe. Um, it's, uh, it's dose dependent in the sense that the more you take, the more powerful your experience is. Um, it has a lot of GI side effects because essentially it causes like a food poisoning experience. And as you're digesting it, um, and that psilocybin becomes active and you have the second psychedelic experience. Um, I think that in the future, it will be a drug that is used in low doses to really help people manage their mood. Um, I think there's going to be a role for it as, a, you know, as a very safe substitute to something like an SSRI. There's a lot of people doing something called microdosing, which doesn't have a lot of evidence to support it but it's becoming very popular, especially in communities like ours where people are trying to biohack past this crazy world we live in. Um, so I, 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 am, I think that ultimately that will probably be the, be the drug that does the most good for people, um, uh, assuming it doesn't get stymied in its process to become legal. And there's some um, states, I think it's Oregon, that are working on decriminalizing it in a similar way that they've done with marijuana. A lot of people are nervous about it, but frankly, it's a very safe drug. Um, you can abuse everything. You can abuse sugar to the point that you're sick, right? So, uh, you know, we, I think people can be responsible and, and I do think that that's a drug that should become more uh, available to people. Um, and people are wisening up to it. It's very similar to cannabis in this way. Hey Gary, I appreciate it. Unfortunately, I have to go to another meeting shortly, but do you um, tell us how we can get a hold of you? How do people get a hold of your practice? Where you are on social media? And then, are you on telemedicine? And if so, what states are you licensed in? Yeah, absolutely. Well, right now, I, right now our license goes across state lines because of COVID. You know about that, Sean? So right now, I can kind of see patients everywhere. I'm really only licensed in California, but you know, as I'm kind of becoming more popular, uh, and this new rule is out there. I'm, I'm seeing folks on telemedicine through from around the country uh, until that changes. And then if, if it's something that makes a lot of sense, I'll start kind of pursuing more medical licenses, but you can find me uh, on Instagram at DR Gary evolve. Um, I do most of my, you know, sort of social communication there. And then um, if you want to book with me, if you want to learn more about ketamine, evolvehealthcare.com e v o l v e healthcare all one word dot com um, you could dm me if you have questions on on instagram um, you can schedule a telemedicine visit with me uh, through my front office frankly and you can book online you can just call my office and schedule something and um, yeah that's the easiest way i'm pretty available and and i'm out there so
Oh, one more thing. I know. I just, I also want to mention, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I like Sean, I'm trying to promote these healthy way of living and eating. And one of the ways I do that is through my organization, Sapien. So if you want to learn more about that, just check it out, sapien.org. Gary, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, guys. you Sean. Have a great day. Uh, we'll see you back tomorrow. We-